number two one eco-friendly farming practices in trinidad's northern range making changes from within i can clearly state that the project that had the most impact on my life was the Cropper Foundation project to implement sustainable farming practices in Trinidad's northern range communities. This project lasted three years, from November 2009 to April 2012, and within that period, it revealed some very valuable lessons. For starters, this project revealed how costly our food production system had become in Trinidad since we adopted most of the technology of the Green Revolution. By using new fertilizers, herbicides and pesticides, farmers were producing better yields. Selective breeding practices, along with genetic modification, allowed them to produce more with fewer resources. But there was a cost, and it had to do with the impact of these very chemicals on human health and the environment. A case in point was a chemical called chlorodirone, a pesticide known as ketone that was widely used in the Caribbean to fight the banana weevil. French health authorities had expressed the concern that it could be linked to the high rates of prostate cancer in their eastern Caribbean islands of Guadeloupe and Martinique and subsequently they banned all fish imports into mainland France from these overseas territories. A study in Guadeloupe covering the period 2005 to 2007 had found Ordecone in 67% of 623 men diagnosed with prostate cancer. Agricultural workers who had long sought compensation for contamination from this pesticide, banned in France but used in the country's Caribbean islands of Martinique and Guadeloupe, finally got their day in court in 2021, that is, after a nearly 15-year wait. The problem had an added dimension in Trinidad and Tobago. There was a significant amount of small-scale farming using these technologies on the hillsides of the northern range of mountains in Trinidad. All the experiences with the destruction of the forests, hillside erosion from small-scale farming, downstream flooding from an increased runoff during heavy downpours, they all have produced a sense of sadness on how this very activity upon which we depended for food was spoiling our own once beloved landscape. Ten years prior, we were not seeing these islands as dysfunctional landscapes, but as individual cases in which poor stewardship of resources had taken its toll. This project made us aware of the landscape dimension of small-scale farming, where we learned to view the activities of human beings and institutions as an integral part of the system, rather than as external agents. That produced a very unique dilemma. It suggested that we needed to intervene in the system while continuing to remain an integral part of the system. It was called Making Changes from Within. Cropper Foundation Project The Cropper Foundation Project was designed to contribute to efforts to improve land management and food security in Trinidad and Tobago. The key pillar was the refinement and implementation of a model for enhancing resilience, economic viability, and sustainability of livelihoods of small holders farming on the hillsides in Trinidad's northern range. We were not going to try to move them off the hillsides. We were simply trying to make their practices compatible with the best efforts to reduce land degradation. The project focused on four watersheds in the northern range. 
namely Maracas, Cora, Lopino, and Aripo Valleys. Here, a significant amount of unsustainable hillside farming was going on, reducing the ability of the watersheds to provide key ecosystem services of national importance, including freshwater provision, erosion prevention, and flooding regulation. Farms in these watersheds were between 2 to 10 hectares, producing mainly short-term cash crops on gentle to steep sloping land parcels. To concretize our system of technical intervention and support, we reformulated our process of intervention in these areas in the following ways. By building a common understanding among stakeholders, identifying leverage points for intervention, analyzing different farming scenarios, converging with the basic decision support systems, assisting in stakeholder negotiations, identifying system performance indicators, and assisting in evaluation of impact. Our biggest challenge, however, was in convincing our farm clients that they were farming in a very sensitive area which we called a high nature value area. The value of the northern range. The value of the northern range of mountains in Trinidad had already been established. The northern range accounted for 70% of the country's water supply. This area was habitat for more species biodiversity in fauna and flora than in any other place in Trinidad. This area held the hope of finding plant species of medicinal value to our population. Take the Cora Valley, for instance. 25% of the regional corporation lived in the valley. Upwards of 1,611 businesses were in the valley, and 50,000 295 persons would be directly affected by any unintended environmental changes in the Cora Tagarigua watershed. The high nature value of the Cora Valley springs from many factors. I can list them off the top of my head. Fresh water made available to upstream and downstream populations, land space for housing and agriculture, timber and non-timber products of the forest, minerals and building materials available, fisheries including freshwater and marine products, water retention, capacity to control runoffs and risks of flooding, capacity for soil conservation, capacity to absorb changes in the ecosystem in relation to waste, recreational opportunities such as river liming, ecotourism as a revenue earner, and cultural and religious values. You may ask, does that mean that the high nature value is synonymous with lots of economic opportunity? No, it's more than that. When I made a recommendation to the OECS Secretariat for the introduction of complementary measures to ensure rural development addresses other issues such as sustainability of small-scale production, gender inequality, income and policy convergence, and the rural to urban migration. This was the image that was present in my mind. The Cropper Foundation project was a team effort to modify the farming practices of persons in the Northern Range. There was a common expectation that once educated with the data concerning their physical space, citizens would formulate their own individual decisions to protect their livelihood. Not only did we expect them to tout this knowledge in the bars, restaurants, mandirs, churches, and schools, but as ultimate users of this data to demand higher quality of services from their local and national government. We even had some local councillors seeking us out to find out what data we were sharing with their constituents. Most of our time was spent visiting farmers wherever they farmed and reasoning with them 
about the impact of the chemicals they were using. We were simultaneously promoting a wider education and understanding through our research into alternative practices that were deemed more eco-friendly. Our direct actions and demonstrations were aimed at getting 20% of the farming population to establish alternative farming practices. We promoted individual agronomic practices that were both cost effective and ecologically friendly to the environment. We showed them some estimates of the cost savings because we knew that nothing convinces a farmer better than numbers. We supported efforts to expand their narrow production objectives towards the inclusion of other demands to improve socioeconomic services that may enhance livelihoods and well-being of the communities. As such, we validated their demand for improved access routes, coordinated marketing services, and, possibly to the annoyance of the ministry, created specific demand on the extension services for crop management advice. Indeed, tension with the extension division caused us to hold sessions with the extension officers, which incidentally gave us an opportunity to counter the efforts of the agrochemical outlets who were using these very extension offices as sub-agents to promote their products. Landscape Agriculture Landscape Agriculture involves long-term collaboration among different groups of land users and stakeholders to achieve multiple objectives and expectations within the landscape for local livelihood, health, and well-being. We identified a new category which we called our community of responsible actors with whom we tirelessly sought cooperation in this project to introduce sustainable farming practices. Responsible actors identified, besides the individual farmers, were the Ministry of Food Production, the Extension and the Forestry Divisions, active NGOs, farmer organizations, and supporting institutions such as ICA, TABA, NAMDEFCO, and UE Cardi. In 2017, that was about five years after we had completed our project. I received a copy of a new study published by the Stockholm Resilience Center entitled Sustainable Science for Biosphere Future. The authors were arguing for ecosystem services and resilience-based interventions in agricultural landscapes to help achieve sustainable development goals and guide future research. The objective of this study was to establish agricultural landscapes as the most important solution space for addressing sustainable development goals on environment and food security. It proposed a new framework that can help to tackle the complexity of agricultural landscapes. This was new to them, but not to us. We had completed our project five years earlier and had already found this out in our own intervention in farming in high nature value environments. The High Nature Value Index The Stockholm study detailed five core principles to help guide future research and to operationalize interventions. We had already identified the same five years ago, but with one important exception. In our agricultural landscapes, we had this critical element, element number three, HNV indexing. Stockholm would not have had this because we are the ones who created the instrument. Here was the problem. Most agricultural landscapes in Trinidad and in other Caribbean islands comprise the mosaic of natural and or human-modified ecosystems. 
often with a characteristic configuration of topography, vegetation, different land use, and settlement options, all influenced by the ecological, historical, economic, and cultural practices of a not too distant past. For us, to preserve the integrity of this type of landscape, everyone would have to adopt a minimum of ecologically farming practices, regardless of who you are or where you came from. The farmer at the lower level receives all the runoffs from farmers operated at higher elevation. If those above are using an extensive amount of poisonous chemicals, no matter how much ecological practices the lower level farming utilizes, we will never be able to maintain the integrity of the landscape because of the nature of the farming activities in the upper regions of the landscape. So how do you control the integrity of the landscape? During our exercise, I created the High Nature Value Index, HNVI. The index asked each farmer eight basic questions about his knowledge and farming practices. On the basis of these responses, it calculated an index number between 1 and 100 for him. Scores 100 to 86 meant your practices definitely have a strong ecological bent. Continue to follow through on your practices and share them with others. Scores 85 to 65 You are definitely on the way to a strong eco-friendly farming practice. Strengthen your practices by examining the weak points. Scores 65 to 45 there are some lessons that you can learn from nature itself. If you are interested in pursuing an eco-friendlier farming system, explore some of these alternatives. And for scores below 44, there may be a few chemical uses that are causing your index to tank. You can definitely improve your performance by changing both your inputs and also your approach to crop production. The High Nature Value Index is a tool with a significant amount of potential. If we had financing to interview all farm plots on the landscape, we could conceivably produce an HNVI overlay of this physical space with HNVI index numbers. That will tell us who is endangering the integrity of the landscape by the way they conduct their farming. Fair pressure and mutual cooperation can then be used to help low-scoring farmers improve on their practices. Agricultural incentives and agricultural credit could be linked to achieving a minimum HVNI index number consistent with the average score in the landscape. Produce can be labeled by the HVNI score in their primary location. Extension services and farm shops can provide meaningful information to farmers as to the impact of their recommended inputs on raising or lowering HNVI scores. Just like we all know what foods we consume that are likely to increase our blood pressure. This is what I've called in another case, incipit development, a condition where everything starts to feed off of each other. Whenever I think of the potential of the HNVI, I cannot help but remember Dennis Pantin's slogan, from winner take all, to all take win. I was really intent on driving home this point. To a company, the HNVI, I produced 51 page leaflets of useful information for farming in a more ecologically friendly manner. All of them were aimed at providing a continuous feed of useful information to small farmers in the efforts to devise strategies to improve their farming practices. So what happened here? Well, a close act associate used to always warn me 
that if I wanted to have any useful innovation made acceptable in the corridors of Caribbean decision making, I had to send the idea to Miami or Amsterdam and then let it come back in as if it were coming from foreign. Well, I guess I simply could not afford the plane ticket. Mm -hmm.